Now that I have a basic platform ready, I'll need to add an embedded system to actually control my robot. For my robot's embedded system, I'm planning on using this ESP32 controller and develop the software using the familiar Arduino platform. The ESP32 will provide the processing power and memory resources I'll need to implement the robot's control system. It will also provide the hardware needed in the form of its definable serial functionality for communicating with the robot's GPS and compass. The ESP32 also has wireless networking, which will allow the robot to communicate with my smartphone for user localization purposes. In order for my robot to know where I am located, it will need to get that information from my smartphone. To do that, I will use my smartphone to connect to the ESP32 over Wi-Fi using my phone's web browser. The ESP32 will send back a web page that includes code to read the phone's GPS coordinates and then send those coordinates back to the ESP32. When the ESP32 receives that information, it will read the robot's own GPS coordinates and perform the calculations to determine its new heading and distance. The results of those calculations will be used to control and move the robot to my location, effectively causing the robot to follow me around. By using an ESP32 in this manner, it allows me to make the robot a self-contained system. No extra software will need to be developed or installed on the smartphone to control the robot. Also, anyone with a smartphone can easily use the robot as needed, without running into any complex set of procedures or other issues. You can do something similar with your own robot and its embedded system, provided that it has the proper resources for serving up a web page, while also handling the calculations on board for control and localization. I'm going to add a beacon light to this pole, something like this one. It will be used when the robot is in motion to warn others about the potential hazard. In addition to the beacon light, I also want to add a means for an audible alert so that the robot has a second way to announce its intentions to move before it actually does so. These devices are not just for safety purposes, but can also act as a way for the robot to communicate its status to others. I first need to fabricate and install the visible and audible alert beacons on this pole. Both will operate on 12 volts using transistor switches controlled by the ESP32. So let's begin with that. So I have here set up on this proto board my two transistor switches that I have configured in order to control the beacon light here as well as the audible alert beacon here and I put a little piece of tape on the audible alert beacon because it's kind of loud it actually it actually kind of sounds like a fire alarm um, or you know just something really kind of piercing um, which you want <laughs> but uh, not for uh, testing purposes so what I want to first show is uh, what the uh, current uh, usage is um, by the, the that these transistors are going to be taking. I've got things set up where this uh, where the ESP32 is being powered by 5 volts but on this rail here is 3.3 uh, volts and um, I'm going to I have this uh, little probe wire thing here coming from the 3 volts going over here where I have these two these two uh, base resistors that were uh, calculated to give a very low current being pulled from the ESP32's um, pins because they can only support uh, 12 milliamps and I didn't want to um, I didn't want to pull anything more than that from them to drive these uh, transistor switches. These two uh, transistors they're uh, called uh, a TIP102, TIP102 and uh, they're actually Darlington transistors, uh, um, consist internally of two transistors that are paired together in a particular way to up their uh, current level. So um, let's uh, let me show you what this uh, what this gonna what this is going to do as far as current. And you should see right here the uh, current value 
and uh, whenever I apply the current for the light, um, whoop, so oh, <laughs> I got to turn this thing on first. Uh, yeah, all right, there we go. Now uh, this uh, this light here actually shows the 12 volts, and this obviously is showing uh, the uh, the uh, power supply for the uh, board over here. So uh, let's try this again. All right, so going here. And uh, there we got the light turned on, and you should be able to see on the multimeter that it's about uh, one milliamp. And uh, that's, that's great. That's exactly what we want. The uh, transistor turns on, lights the light, and uh, doesn't draw hardly any current at all in order to do so. So uh, the other one is the, uh, is the beeper here, and it'll draw about the same amount. So uh, let's look at it. You can probably hear it. It's, uh, I hope you can hear it, um, and you can see that it, it is, again, it's about uh, one milliamp. Um, so, between these two, um, they'll draw, I'm going to hook them up, and uh, you can see this uh, light flashing here. This is on GPIO pin 2. Um, I'm going to move the, uh, move the uh, probe here, and this is, let's see, one, two, three, four, okay, five. Fifth one up here. Is the uh, is the GPI 2 pin that actually is connected up to this LED that's on board the uh, ESP32? So uh, we can just move this and uh, first uh, take it over to uh, to the light, and there it goes. It's uh, flashing in sequence with the uh, with the other one, and uh, if we want, we can also uh, drive the uh, speaker to do the same thing. And so, you know, that's basically it. This uh, circuit I'm going to recreate, or I'm going to put onto a piece of perf board or a piece of uh, a piece of um, PCB to uh, add the to add this to add the uh, ESP32 onto it and combine some other stuff so that these can uh, be hooked up to drive this these two alert uh, beacons on the robot itself. So that's where I'm headed at. That's where I'm headed to uh, next. Um, but first, before I can do that, in order to, in order to continue on with this, I need to make a special, make a special cable for the GPS unit in order to uh, hook it up to the, to the, well, I'll get into that in a little bit. So uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, you know, this is, this is it. We're going to be uh, doing, uh, going to be doing that uh, cable and, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll show you what exactly that's all about here in a second. Okay, so I have a GPS, my GPS unit here, and uh, what I need to do is I need to fabricate a new cable or a cable for it in order to be able to plug it into this, into an RS-232 converter that's kind of like this. What, this does is it takes the TTL 3.3 volt TTL voltage level signals from the ESP32 and using a MAX232 chip on board it'll convert them into standard RS-232 signals that'll go to the GPS unit and uh, this GPS unit though has a very interesting I guess I have it upside down <laughs> has a very interesting uh, plug on it uh, in order to plug into it and it was meant for well it was meant for something you had to buy from Garmin and I'm not even sure if you can still buy them anymore but I'm not gonna buy anything I've got everything I can I, I have in order to build it um, there are ways you can take one of these apart I don't want to do that because I do like to use this GPS unit occasionally um, it's a it's a good little it's a good little tool overall. So what I'm going to do is just interface to it how it was designed. And the way it was designed is it has this little flap back here that pops off. And let me see if I can show it to you. It's got this uh, four contacts there and uh, a, a kind of a special or an interesting uh, little like slide it's got you gotta ha, gotta have something that'll slide in there with contacts on it to contact those four contacts and uh, one contact is ground one contact is power and the other two are for send and receive and uh, I just need to make a little cable that'll have I'll probably use probably a piece of old credit card or some thin plastic that can slot in there 
along with uh, some uh, some piece of wire and some kind of uh, I don't know brass contacts or something to make contact with those contacts on here and uh, then that cable can then run to um, to a converter like this and this will be mounted inside inside the uh, uh, enclosure on on that piece of perf board along with the ESP32 so that the ESP32 can communicate with the GPS unit and uh, get the uh, you know get the uh, GPS coordinates from it as well as uh, the compass heading and all that good stuff that we need for our robot. So that's what I'm going to do next is I'm going to fabricate that uh, cable and uh, you know play around with that and make sure that's all working good and uh, you know then uh, you know then we'll just move on from that. So here are the measurements and information for the uh, Garmin eTrex input output port on it. Uh, the uh, piece that I have to make is going to be 11 sixteenths inch wide and about 9 sixteenths inch long. I've got these markings right here that are the exact size and I'm going to cut out a piece of this I don't know what it is, gift certificate card or something that got in the mail I don't drink wine. Anyhow, I'm going to cut out a piece of that to match these values. And uh, then we'll have to drill some holes and whatnot, uh, or poke some holes. It'd probably be a closer thing, maybe use a pin or something, to uh, match up uh, for these uh, contacts on the back of the thing, or on the back of the Garmin. And uh, then once we have that done, then we can uh, solder some wires onto it and uh, finish her up. So we're going to get to that. So I measured off and uh, cut out a little piece of the card right here. And uh, it's a bit, little bit longer than, uh, than the uh, 9 16 but I'm um, actually thinking maybe I might leave it like that. Um, just because I need something to support the wire or the cable that's going to come out of the end and uh, You know that's uh, it, you know, it can act as a little bit of support this uh, this thing's uh, fairly small But uh, it does fit. Let me uh, let me uh, Quickly uh, slot it in here So whoa, okay, yeah, so it does fit inside slides right there but you can see that I still need to cut out where the key is in order to allow that to slide all the way through. And then once I have that done, then I'll uh, then I'll uh, take a nail or a thumbtack and uh, mark off the holes that uh, need to go, you know, need to go uh, for the for the contacts mark out the holes so that we can in insert wires in there to make the contacts and uh, get that all ready so we'll move on to that all right so now i have the uh, holes made things cut out i got the key made as well kind of rounded the edges to make it a little less sharp and painful in case you mess up or something now what I need to do is uh, take some thin wire. I'm just going to use uh, some wire like uh, this uh, probe wire I have here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, thread that through these holes. And uh, that'll make the uh, contacts. It'll actually be not on. It'll actually be on the back side here. And uh, that'll make the contacts. And then well. I got to uh, solder on some actual wire and whatnot and make it all look pretty. So we'll do that. So this wire that I'm using is actually a solid. Is actually basically the strands out of a solid core um, Ethernet cable. Uh, I've just uh, taken a bit of it and uh, stripped off the insulation. So now I have a piece of uh, just bare copper. And I'm going to cut that into pieces in order to thread it through the holes and uh, make the uh, make the uh, con make the contacts for uh, this interface. And uh, then uh, once I uh, have that done, 
then I'm going to uh, take this uh, modular uh, telephone cable for conductor and you can see kind of maybe where I got it uh, picked it up cheap favorite thrift store <laughs> so uh, got that a long time ago I didn't know if I'd ever use it but uh, you know hey you never know what happens so we're gonna get that done and then we're gonna take this and we're gonna strip this back we're gonna solder it to uh, these uh, conductors here and then gonna kind of braid it through these two larger holes that I used a hole punch and uh, then that should act as kind of like a strain relief and then uh, I'll probably take some heat shrink tubing or something to go over that to hold it all in place so uh, we'll see what happens when I get there so uh, let's uh, go ahead and do that and this is our uh, modular cable stripped uh, we've moved about a quarter inch of insulation off the back of, or off the ends of the uh, wire and uh, we're going to tin these up and uh, solder them to the pieces of uh, copper wire I have here and uh, get this uh, get this thing assembled so uh, let's go do that okay so uh, here's the uh, modular cable with the uh, with the uh, wires tinned and attached and uh, I'm going to insert it into that uh, piece of card and bend things over and might add some uh, Heat, sh heat shrink tubing over the top of those but uh, that's where we're heading to now so um, I'll be back shortly and show you what things look like all right so we have the adapter built this is what it looks like as you can see we got the uh, we got the We got the terminals or whatnot put on there, but if I rotate this, notice how flat they are with the surface of the card. This is what the other side looks like, by the way. This is actually the top side, the side that uh, would be seen um, whenever you slot it in place. Um, what I did was, is those pieces there, I bent them over, and just before I bent them all the way over, I heated them up with a lighter and then I squeezed them down into the card so that you know while it's not exactly super flush I mean not as not as much as you could but it's pretty well embedded in there it's hard to hard to get a good uh, view of it but uh, you know you can kind of see uh, you can kind of see that uh, there's not much in the way of these uh, pieces of wire sticking up from the card so it fits in to the slot very very nicely and this is what it looks like uh, fitted into the slot I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to put you down for a second so let's uh, let's hold on for a second here whoa there you go all right so I'm just going to slot this in place slightly to show you how it is aligned up in a way I'm not even sure you can hear me right now <laughs> all right well okay here we go so See how, the, see how the wires are lined up with the uh, contacts on the GPS unit? This uh, just slides all the way in. It's a pretty tight... F there you go. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I don't know. I must have hit pause. Oh, well. All right. So, yeah. It's tight fit, but it fits well. And uh, I was going... I was going... I was thinking about putting a piece of... Uh, large heat shrink tube tubing over this but it's actually doesn't really need it I don't think and I'm kind of afraid that if I did try to heat shrink it down I might melt things too much so I'm gonna leave it as is this uh, this uh, little threading through these two holes I made with the hole punch um, actually makes a pretty nice strain 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 relief and uh, you know whenever this is mounted onto the uh, onto the robot it's going to be kind of like this with the screen facing up it'll it'll have a fairly nice uh, you know the strain relief will uh, keep it uh, nice and you know won't uh, let it pop out of the slot so uh, you know that's uh, that's basically how that's basically that's basically it right there um, what I'm thinking about or what I'm going to do next is uh, actually 
put uh, some kind of ends uh, so that we can plug this thing into a header on on the uh, on the PCB that'll be inside the enclosure. Uh, so I need to put some I need to put some uh, some kind of ends or something on the other end of this uh, of this cord of this uh, modular cable. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be the uh, that'll be the next thing I'm going to be doing here. So. We'll get that done, and then when that's done, the cable will be finished. Oh, one other thing, I I kind of like well, sort of kind of color code this. I made I made the uh, I made the ground black, and I made the power. Well, I'm not sure which one's which. Um, let's see, yeah, power is uh, yeah, power is this one right here. This one right after the key. I made that one red. I made the ground that's over on the other side. I made that uh, black. And the other two are like yellow and green. I'm not exactly sure which which is which, but uh, I'll figure those out. And uh, those are the uh, transmit and the receive on each one of those. So, you know, just uh, just gotta just gotta uh, make some notes over here. You can see my glasses there. <laughs> gotta make some notes over here so that I know what's what uh, for whenever I actually plug it into the uh, into the RS232. Uh, translator converter voltage converter thing um, so that uh, we don't get any of that mixed up so uh, we'll do that next all right so there are the finished ends both ends of the cable are ready and uh, we can uh, continue on with the next thing which is actually mounting the uh, beacons and the GPS unit onto the top of that pole and running this cable down it. So uh, we'll be doing that next. But uh, you can see that I added a couple of small, uh, I don't know what they're called, JST connectors. I don't know, they're just scrap that I had. And I, and I made sure that they're all color-coded. We got uh, black is ground, green is transmit, yellow is receive, and the final one red is power for three volts if if I wanted to power the uh, GPS unit which maybe at a later point I'll do that uh, initially I'm going to be just using batteries uh, in in the GPS unit but uh, I'll have to get uh, some kind of uh, three volt uh, converter or something which I don't have right now in order to be able to power that uh, GPS unit and once I can do that well you know that'll eliminate batteries and it'll uh, make it all nice and everything so we're going to uh, next move on to uh, making making uh, getting that getting those beacons mounted to the pole. So uh, we'll be doing that next. Now that I have the beacons working in prototype form and the custom data cable fabricated for the GPS, I can move on to mounting it to the pole. I'll fabricate a bracket from this piece of plywood and mount it to the top of the pole using these small angle brackets, something like this. A hole will be drilled in the plywood to allow me to pass the data and power cables up the middle of the pole, through the plywood, and to the beacons and GPS. I'll attach the beacons and GPS to the bracket and drill a hole in the pole right around here to allow the cables to exit and connect to the ESP32 inside the enclosure. Before I can modify the pole, I have to take it off the robot. And to do that, I have to remove the entire panel and the battery and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm going to do that first and uh, then uh, we'll go out to the shop and start making the modifications. All right, <laughs> so we're out here in my shop. I'm gonna get some fabricating going on. Okay, so uh, what I got, I have my pole here. I've taken off the robot, and I've marked a marked a spot on it, right there, to uh, where I'm gonna drill it out at. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to mount it into uh, my into my workmate workmate bench here and uh, just use it as a simple clamp 
That's what it's for. Like that. Yeah, like that. Make sure it's all good and tight. That should be good enough. Should push through there. All right. So I've got to drill a hole that's large enough to accommodate these three cables. We have our data cable, of course. And then we have these uh, two 22 gauge dual conductor uh, cables, which uh, will be used to supply power to the audio or audible and visible beacons. So uh, they'll uh, run down into the enclosure and hook up to those uh, transistors and uh, be activated in that way. And from what I've determined, I'm going to need a hole that's about a half inch in diameter um, in order to fit these through. Now, even so, even, even so, it isn't going to be easy to fit those cables through, but uh, I don't really have a choice. Uh, I've got to fit them, yeah, i got to fit them through a hole that's uh, really small and is not in a very convenient location. Um, but we'll make it work. And if we don't, we'll figure out something else. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do first is... Uh, Get my uh, punch and make a small divot so for my so my drill won't wander. Wandering drills don't like that. And then uh, I don't know if I'll do a pilot or not. I'm not really sure if it really needs it because I'm going to be drilling out a half inch and I'm just going to be using a step drill. Let's see what size that go up to. That doesn't that go up high enough. I'm not sure on this one. Huh, yeah, this one will go up high enough. All right. So, just going to get my drill here. And I got to say, I really like this drill. It might be small, but it's really powerful. It's only an 8 volt uh, Black and Decker, but, uh, you know, it does everything I need. Maybe a little bit more. going to drill this out. Okay, I can't go any further with this. I just realized that because, well, I'll drill through the other side. <laughs> uh, I guess I should have planned this a little bit better. <laughs> now, our, let's see what we got here. Uh, we got this one, which... Can probably go up a couple more steps it's a little bit shorter worst case I'll just have to get out a regular half inch drill and finish it so. and uh, this I believe I don't know what size that is exactly I'll fit this down in here Alright, it goes to there, which is, oh, it's hell to get old. Ah, I need to go one more, but I don't know if I really can. We'll see what we can do. I need to go one more step. I believe, I believe, you know what, I'm going to measure this just to make sure. I don't want to make this too large. Well, it seems to fit uh, on the long side, you know, because you're drilling into a drilling into a cylinder. The it looks longer this way than it is this way. But uh, yeah, it looks like uh, on the long side that uh, yeah, it's a half inch. So that's probably the right size when it gets right down to it. Um, you know what? I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, we'll try fitting we'll try fitting in a grommet and. Uh, you know, see, you know, see, you know, it's better, you know, you can only do this once, <laughs> so, you know, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to oversize the hole. All right. You can always play a flute. 
All right, so uh, so yeah, there we uh, there we have the uh, the hole. Our cables are going to go through here and come out the top. So what we need to uh, fabricate next is our wooden bracket. So I'm going to what I'm going to have to do first is. Uh, basically what I'm going to do first is, uh, well, make some, make some markings on this and then round the corners. And uh, then we'll uh, drill out the holes needed for the brackets and everything else. And I'll also have to drill holes on this, but I'll mark those after I come on here. And uh, we'll just, uh, we'll just uh, continue on from that. So I have my uh, hole marked out on this uh, piece of wood, and I'm going to try a little something. I don't know how well it's going to work, but uh, if it works out all right, great. If it doesn't, well, haven't lost much. Let's see if I can uh, use my hand drill here to drill a hole through this. Very carefully and hopefully hardly penetrate the back side. And I'm just going to do this up. See that's how fast it went through. I couldn't couldn't stop that. Alright, well, yeah. You try <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It's a you know it's the same kind of wood and yeah, you can... I don't know what to say, man. Alright, well... That was a good try, but that's about it. What I wanted to do is I wanted to see if I could slowly drill on both sides and not mess up this veneer on the back. Not that I really care about it, but... Uh, you know, it's just it all splinters out. You know, you saw what the back of that... Uh, panel on the robot looks like. Not very pretty. Oh well, it is what it is. So, uh, we'll, uh, got that hole there. What we'll do is say that was a failed attempt there. <laughs> and, uh, leave it at that. So what we're going to do next is why are you not fitting it? There we go. I think. Oh, no. Shoot. <laughs> I just lost my 16th bit. I don't know where it went. Oh, well. Uh, we're going to take our step drill. And we're just going to drill out this hole. The same to, well, basically the same size because that's what we need it. about uh let's see where yeah there we go yeah that's about it come back through the other side I clean it up a little bit and yeah that should allow us to easily pass through our data cable and everything. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. That will work. So, so yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, we actually did uh, by going through one side and with a small drill, and then uh, using the step drill through the veneer side. I'll show you kind of what we're getting at. We got a nice clean hole. <laughs> uh, however. On the other side, you can see that there's some broken out uh, veneer. <laughs> Can't win. Can't win. It won't let us. But uh, yeah, you know, with uh, these two uh, these two things, pass it through. Oh, and by the way, that hole that I drilled in the uh, in the uh, in the pole, half inch, 
fits the uh, grommet just fine and I was actually able to successfully fish these through which we'll get to in a minute and I'll show you how I did it um, but uh, yeah all these can easily just pass through these this hole more or less not to uh, get it in there just like that so you know they'll be passed through and uh, everything will be nice and wired up so uh, yeah if I can just get this back and yeah, we'll get to it <laughs> you don't want to watch me fish this stuff through so yeah our next uh, our next thing our next thing is uh, to essentially mount this or mark the holes I should say I'm not going to be mounted just yet but mark the holes and drill them out maybe maybe I don't know we may, we may round it first I'm not sure but uh, yeah you know just uh, we gotta essentially mount this right where that hole is and uh, mount the brackets and everything and uh, basically get her done so uh yeah i think what i'll do is round it off first and uh i'll get that set up and uh, we'll return and show you that happening okay so i learned my lesson from last time first thing i'm going to do before i fire this uh my homebrew sander up oh whoa don't want to fall that'd be funny wouldn't it Actually, it wouldn't be funny to me, but I bet you guys would get a laugh out of it. <laughs> All right, we're just going to disconnect our smoke alarm. And we'll find a handy spot for this. Get my, uh, get my safety gear on here. All right, now we're safe. Actually, no, that is in our full safety gear because I don't really, you know, I built this thing and I honestly, I, I'm just waiting for this disc to fly apart because this thing is moving way too fast. I wish there was something different I could do, but there really isn't. So, but it is what it is, what it is. All right, so put on our safety goggles. So if this thing flies apart, at least my, at least my eyes will be safe. Alright, turn it on, let it come up to speed. now here we have it you got it all nice and rounded off I only had to do three sides because the fourth side was already done I think it was one of my tests on the uh, machine back there and uh, now we're ready to mark our holes for the brackets so we'll go ahead and do that see you in a bit okay so uh, getting ready to uh, drill the holes out in the uh, on the on the uh, beacon bracket or whatever you want to call it that goes up the top of the pole and uh found some screws and everything for my for my angle brackets that i'm going to be using as you can uh, see there uh but these are fairly small and the holes in them the screws i want to use which are a couple of these and one longer one that's going to go through the tube and they're just slightly too too big for the holes that are in the bracket so what I gotta do is drill the holes out. 
And that's going to be done with a 532nd inch bit. And I hope I don't break it because it's the only one I have right now. So, we're just going to put a bracket in our vise here. Actually, I kind of want to get it in the center if I can. All right, there we go. I'll clamp it good and tight. And I'll just uh, drill it out. All right, there's one. One hole in one bracket. I get second hole in the in the bracket. Basically does it. Now, that should fit, yep. That's exactly what I want. Just like that. So, uh, I'm gonna finish modifying the other bracket, and uh, then uh, we're going to uh, mount one here and drill out the pole and uh, show you what it looks like when it's all together. So I drilled out the holes and mounted the brackets. You can see right here. This is what I got right now. There we go, yeah. Alright, so got the brackets, got the holes all drilled out. And then what I did is just basically fitted it over the end of the pole where where it was roughly supposed to go and rotated it until I had it where I thought it should be aligned. <laughs> yeah, famous last words. Um, so, like this. And then I marked, uh, marked two marks onto the end of the pole. You can see one there, and one opposite right there. And these are pretty much in line along the length of the pole with the other holes so I don't know if it's gonna face straight ahead or not it's probably gonna be cockeyed but what can you do you know I mean this is junk botics this ain't precision botics and it certainly isn't Boston robotics -y. and it'll never be that <laughs> so we're going to drill these holes out and the way we're gonna do that Get our handy dandy punch. Punch that one. Loosen it up a bit so we can rotate it. Punch the other one. Then we'll just use our drill that we used to drill out those uh, brackets since we need the same size anyhow. There's one hole. We'll do a test fit with our bolt that's going to go through. Seems like it fits just great. It had better have had fit just great. Otherwise something was would be really wrong with I think the universe. Get this situated just like that. There we go. All right. And 
here are the holes. I mean, like you guys haven't seen holes before. One there, the opposite side. And uh, we will take a racket. Fit, look at it, see what it looks like. Get enough. Get our nut and bolt. Unfortunately, this uh, bolt was a little long. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what it's going to look like real quick. And I'm actually going to trim the bolt down so that uh, it doesn't do a, it doesn't have a lot of uh, stick out or anything. Which isn't that big of a deal, but, you know, I don't know. I like things to be a little, I like things to work right. Let's see, let me get, let me get this uh, easier said than done. And of course, the bolt's a little bit too long, so because of the other things, that's kind of in the way. So, shove it back and then we'll worry about it later. The lock washer, because those things work so well. I've seen the video about various lock washers and uh, how they actually work and don't. Unfortunately, I don't have any nylocks that are this particular size, so maybe later I can get, get some proper nylocks or something. All right, get that nut on there if it will cooperate. There we go. Then, if I can locate it, <laughs> do, 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 where, oh, right in front of my face, if it would have been a snake, I would have been dead. All right, I'll just tighten this up a little bit to show you. A little, a little bit tighter. There, that's good. All right. Nice and straight. And that's what it looks like. Just like that. You can see how the bolt kind of sticks out. I'm going to take that down maybe a quarter inch, three eighths, something like that. Make it a little bit smaller. And that's basically the fabrication of this bracket. Now what i got to do is I've got to fabricate the mounts and everything else. To mount the other stuff on it and then once that's in place <laughs> oh so much then oh and just to let you know what I'm going to be using for one of the mounts I've got this found this uh, bicycle reflector out in the desert Literally was hiking along and there it was. People like to ride their bikes out where I hike. And it's got a like a little bracket thing here. And it just about fits the uh, bracket that's on the... Uh, I don't know if I have it here. I, don't, I thought I brought it out with me, but I don't see it here. Although, again, it's probably sitting right here in front of my face. Oh, see? Right there in front of my face. Yes, sir, Bob. All right, so yeah, even though it's not really meant to, 
this uh if I can this this thing if I remember right which way to go right this way almost fits on and I can kind of shove it on a little bit but I think if I do a little bit of trimming on some of this uh, plastic here and remove it from the reflector trim off some of these maybe maybe something don't want to trim this then I can just pop this reflector portion off and I'll have a nice little bracket that I can uh, mount on to uh, that piece of wood and uh, that way I can make this this is the back to the uh, GPS I can just pop it off put it on whenever I want to be a uh, removable replaceable changeable whatever and uh, that way uh, you know that way it's not permanently mounted or modified in any way to well I don't want to you know like I said I want to I, I want to keep using it as for what it is for it's uh, for as a GPS type thing even though I carry my phone around I don't know I'm kind of crazy that way so I'm gonna get on to that get these uh, get these uh, other things uh, mounted and such and then we'll uh, go back and I'll show you what it all looks like uh, kind of well sort of kind of on the robot itself so go ahead and do that okay so I'm in the process of uh, I'm going to be mounting the uh, I'm going to be mounting the uh, visible beacon onto this here. Now I've got these two screws here. These are actually the terminals that light up the beacon. And I want to position it basically something like this. Under this board. And I want to I want to take a screw and drive it through this drive it through this piece of plywood to hold this blinker but the blinker itself doesn't actually have a hole see that little divot there what I want to do is drill that divot out just slightly so I can thread in a uh, machine screw but I want to thread it through this board the problem is is I can't see the where the hole is supposed to be now I could measure and transfer the measurements over to this board and pray but why I want to show a little trick I think it'll work I've got a little small ball bearing here it might be a BB I don't know a little small spherical metal thing and I'm gonna set it right in this divot I'm gonna try to keep that without falling see how it's set and then I'm gonna take this piece of wood and I'm going to set it on top and I'm going to align it with these screws just where I want it and you can see see how it's right well I don't know if you can see it or not see how it's whoa <laughs> see how it's positioned well all I have to do now at least this is the theory is press down and this wood is soft enough that it should have taken an impression we'll pull it off and take a look without losing the BB and yes it did and if you notice I don't know if you can see that or not but it's right on the center line <laughs> see that's called uh, working with your brain kind of outside of the box I don't know hell what am I what what the hell do I know anyhow we're going to uh, drill this out and drill this out and well hopefully <laughs> hopefully this actually worked I'll let you know guess what it failed no just kidding worked perfectly just like that and that's why you save a lot of junk see I have ball bearings I don't even know where I can where I got them from some of them in fact, I've got one large one here. Let me show it to you. I'm, if I remember right, this one here, 
my dad found on the side of the road and he gave it to me. I've held on to this thing for 30 years. <laughs> All right, closer to 40. Um, why? I don't know. But one day it will come into use. I guarantee it. So, so now I have one part mounted on it. I need to get that bracket modified. Now that bracket, I'm going to have to make something or drill out a hole so it'll have some clearance for that screw. But uh, beyond that, that's not going to be a big deal. And uh, get that mounted on here and also modified so that it will uh, fit onto, uh, onto the uh, GPS unit properly. And uh, shoot, this is almost done. So I have this bracket modified now. And I'm gonna see, made some modifications to it. So it fit this, which goes to the GPS unit. And I took the reflector off because that's not needed anymore. So what I gotta do now is I need to quickly, uh, well, f put this on and uh, mount it. Get that hole drilled out wherever that screw is. Drill some holes for this to mount it. And uh, just continue on. All right, so this is what it looks like. We've got the uh, got the uh, LED beacon, light beacon here. Got the bracket mounted on top here. Show you in a bit, but I made a little clearance hole. And uh, got the terminals for the uh, LED right up front here, and this is kind of what it looks like. So. Uh, That's pretty much it as far as this pole is concerned. Let me show you what this, uh, what the bracket and everything looks like. So, uh, just made a little clearance hole there in order to uh, mount the LED beacon on, and uh, that pretty much covers it. The uh, GPS unit will mount on that bracket. And uh, then the wires will fit through here. Now, I was going to tell you, show you what I came up with as far as the wires to get them through. And uh, it actually actually works pretty well. And the main one, the main one, the main enchilada guy is uh, this one because it has it has these weird these weird plugs on the end. What I did, or what I'm going to do. I don't trip and fall is because I've got these handy little tools. Now you can probably use tweezers, but these are easy to come by too. They're just a pair of forceps, small forceps. Great for electronics worth work. You know, you can hold on to that whatever and solder on it and use it as a heat sink. That's what I originally got them for. But they're also good for uh, grabbing onto things. So I just have to uh, fish this, uh, feed these in, get one of them in there, get the other one in there, make sure that they get past the same side of the screw, and then essentially feed it down until I see the end, and there it is. And uh, then what I can do is take my forceps and grab one of the connectors. There's one. And then grab the other connector. Like that. And there we have it. There we have it fished all the way through. So, uh, we just do that to the other two cables, hook everything up. This, of course, is going to be down like this, and uh, this will 
hook up into the back of the back of the GPS unit, just kind of like that. And then the other, and then the other pieces, of course, will hook into here. Wires will go into here, and then the other two will go to the enunciator, which I'll mount on the back here. Still have to do that. Real basic though. But that's it. So uh, we're going to uh, we're going to uh, finish this up and uh, call it a day, and then uh, we'll continue on with this uh, some more. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I couldn't 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 wait to uh, get it uh, everything going, but uh, here it is. Got the uh, got the beeper. Well, a different beeper, not the white one. But I got this one. It sounds about the same, just as loud. And put it on some standoffs to raise it up above that uh, nut or the bolt, I should say, that's uh, holding on the uh, angle bracket. And uh, got the wire. Got some of the wires run. The, this wire, this wire here, is actually meant for the enunciator. It's not hooked up yet. They're coming out the bottom. And the data cable, well, it's not run yet, but uh, got my forceps. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. So I just wanted to just wanted to show you guys that. With the beacons and GPS unit mounted on the pole, I'll now need to install the ESP32 inside the enclosure. But to do that, I need to remove the enclosure from the panel. I'll also need to drill an additional hole in the enclosure, probably down here on the bottom, in order to allow for the cables to pass through. I have to be very careful though while doing this to prevent any damage to the existing electronics inside. I mount the ESP32 and other electronics to a piece of protoboard like this. Socket headers, screw terminals, and other parts will be added to make it easy to maintain and expand in the future. Once completed, I'll mount it inside the enclosure and test it out. All right, so before I assemble this uh, proto board and uh, ESP32 into the enclosure, I just kind of wanted to give you guys a look at it before I put it all together because it'll be mostly hidden at that point. And uh, while I won't win any kind of awards for my uh, circuit layout or anything, and certainly not for the wiring, um, it does work. And I've done most of the testing on it outside of the enclosure. Um, well, let me just show you. So, here it is. And what we have here is, well, we got the ESP32 here. Up top here are the two outputs for the motor controllers, the ser servo outputs. Down on the bottom are the two TO2, well, I should say, I should say, uh, the two TIP102 transistor switches for the audible and LED beacon. Down here, this little blue thing, that's the RS-232 um, converter. The, the MAX-232 converts the signals from the uh, TTL RS-232 signals, or TTL serial signals, I should say, from the ESP32 into RS-232 level voltages and outputs them. And then above that is the, well, it's basically a, um, what do you call it, a USB power supply that you would plug into an automobile's uh, electrical outlet, um, cigarette lighter outlet is what I call it because I'm old. Um, most of you know it as probably a power outlet or a DC power outlet, uh, converts it to, you know, like you'd charge a phone um, with. I just took the circuit out of it uses a pretty common uh, microchip in it to convert the 12 volts down to 5 volts and then the 5 volts is is used to run the ESP32 and the ESP32 has its own built-in 3.3 volt uh, regulator 
and I use that to give power to, well, both, you know, both it uses that both for power for the SP32 as well as power that is needed for the RS-232 converter. And uh, these two green terminal blocks over here, they uh, connect to the top one here, uh, or I should say this one here connects to 12 volts, and this one here uh, can output five volts. I don't know if I'll need that. So far, probably not. Everything, all the power comes out for everywhere else on the board and works fine. Oh, and you also see down here these two red LED indicators. So they they basically allowed me to do testing with the uh, on on the ESP32 um, without needing necessarily anything connected. Um, I did test uh, connecting it to the strobe and uh, into the audible beacon. They both work fine. Um, and uh, I also tested the uh, the GPS unit with the RS232, and I was able to get the I was able to get the uh, well, what would you call it, in MEA uh, strings or whatever they are, um, to uh, to come out, and uh, I'll be able to use those in the software. So I just wanted to show you that. That's that side. I'll kind of hold it up a little bit closer, and kind of see all the parts there. Now for the horror. <laughs> Here's the backside. Oh my, oh, OMG, uh, yeah. Um, you can see that, well, there's a variety of soldering going on and those real thin blue lines, well, what that is is I ended up wire wrapping the uh, pins off of the uh, ESP32. I, what I originally wanted to do is I wanted to use some, uh, what do you call it, some header strips to plug the ESP32 in so I could pop the ESP32 out when it, if, if or when I needed to, um, you know, if I needed it for another project or, you know, who knows, you know, if it burned out or something, you know, I didn't want to solder it in place on this board. Um, but I found that what I had, the only kind of uh, strips that I had or header headers that I had were um, uh, machine pin headers. Those were great for uh, you know regular dip ICs, uh, DIP dual inline pin, integrated circuits, you know that kind of stuff. But the pins on the ESP32 were too fat; they couldn't fit down into those holes. And so I wanted to come up with some other way that I could put this together and not worry about you know if I had to remove it and do it. You know that I'd be able still be able to do that without desoldering a bunch of stuff, which can be real difficult at times. It can actually you have you, sometimes you even have to make it has to be destructive in order to do it. I didn't want to do that, and I certainly didn't want to have to rebuild the entire circuit again on another piece of protoboard. Um, so I ended up well, I ended up wire wrapping the pins that I needed, and um, then taking them to where they needed and on some of them in the case of the RS-232 um, converter I uh, actually used a, a header on that that I could wire wrap to on most everywhere else though for like the transistor signals as well as the as well as the uh, servo uh, you know the servo outputs for the motor controllers I just stripped off a little bit off the end and soldered it in place so I can always unwrap it from these pins on the ESP32 if I had to. Uh, to be honest, I hope that never happens. It's uh, it was it was even though it's all there and can be can be fixed, it's kind of tedious. Oh, there's also one thing I wanted to also point out to you. Uh, right here, um, notice this uh, notice this right here this uh, capacitor and this resistor that's kind of next to it right right there got the resistor and the capacitor right next to each other. That forms an interesting a little circuit or a little addition that frankly should have been a part of this particular ESP32. But apparently on these ESP32 certain manufacturers they uh, well they got they cheaped out. Let me just put it that way. What that does is normally whenever you upload code to this uh, thing, you have to press these buttons. There's a couple buttons here. One's called for enable and one's called uh, reset. And you have to 
press these buttons, uh, hold down, I think it was the enable or maybe it was, re you know, I honestly can't remember anymore. You had to press one of those down whenever, you know, with the, using the, using the Arduino software, because I'm not using MicroPython on this, that is an option. And it might be something I might play with, but I'm going to be using the Arduino software and, you know, C++ for, for programming this whole thing. Um, you had to, in order to upload the code, you had, you, you know, it, it would say down below in the, in the serial monitor as it's going, saying, you know, connecting, and you had to hold it down, and it would eventually connect up. What this little circuit does, and I found this, I found this online, um, it, uh, it basically acts as the USB and some other stuff does some strange stuff with that enabled pin and whatnot, and it basically delays some timing to basically cause it to auto connect and auto reset. Um, I shouldn't say auto reset, it already did that in the beginning, but to auto, uh, to basically auto connect instead of having to hold down a button. And that just makes it so much easier because you don't have to worry about holding down that button. And, and these buttons are so darn small that your your finger or, or your finger is almost impossible to use. Um, you know, I, I was using like a small screwdriver or a pencil or whatnot. It slip off and it just it just was annoying, especially whenever you're doing a a rolling kind of development process where you're doing some changes and you want to test it out real quick. Um, adding that thing on it makes it real simple because all you have to do is click upload, wait, it'll reboot, and Hopefully your code works and it runs. Um, just makes uh, development so much uh, easier. So I, I added that onto here because ultimately I wouldn't really have, I wouldn't be able to get access to these buttons. This was going to be inside an enclosure. And I'm going to, the one thing I'm going to do is, or at least this is the plan, and it better work, is I'm mounting this, uh, I'm mounting this on the enclosure in such a manner that with an, a little bit of a adding a new hole to the to the enclosure I should be able to gain access to the USB port and that way I can plug into the USB port and upload my code and do development without needing to take this out of the robot or anything like that um, everything else on this I you know I tested it it works great it's uh, you know it may look ugly it is ugly um, yeah, but, but it does work. It, 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 it really, it really, it really works great. Um, I, 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 I really, I really, I really think it turned out well. Um, one thing that, I guess another thing, I, you know, I, I, you know, I could, I could also point out is this, this, uh, Max 232 converter. It's actually upside down. The chip is on the back side. And the reason I did that is, well, I originally prototyped it on one of the, uh, on one of the, um, uh, breadboards or whatnot. I don't have one sitting around me nearby, um, but you know, one you know, just one of the regular bread, re regular uh, proto board breadboard things, and I needed to be able to plug this into that board, and so what I did is I soldered on four wires on each side. There's power and ground, and then send and receive. One's for TTL, and the other's for RS two thirty two, and uh, they're just like, uh, you know, I tell you. This soldering iron saves will save you so much trouble because it, it's this soldering iron is meant for um, surface mount rework. It's got a very 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 fine tip on it, and it's like a really super fine. It's actually a chisel tip, but you know you'd have to get out a magnifying glass. Well, at least my old eyes would, um, in order to see that it is a chisel tip. Um, it's like a pencil, meant for a very fine rework. Probably not the finest you can do with surface mount nowadays. You know, some of that stuff is like, you know, size of a gnat's hair. Um, but yeah, it allowed me to get into places and solder these small things. But it also the the information about which way the data is flowing, as well as which side was RS232 and which side was TTL, is marked on the back side. And I didn't want to get confused. I wanted to know exactly because if you get these messed up it's not going to work properly so I just decided you know I'll dead bug it that's what it's called essentially where you take your you know usually it's done with a, a dip IC where you flip it upside down 
and you and you mount it and you run wires from the from the legs. It's called dead bug because generally the legs are all splayed out and it looks like a dead bug. Um, I decided to do it that way because it wasn't that big a deal. I don't care if I see the <laughs> see the chip on the other side. Um, and this allowed me to follow the wiring and, and pin out and everything very easily. Um, the only other thing was, is during the construction was making sure that I had the right wire or make sure I had the right pins whenever this was upside down, the ESP32. At one point I accidentally wired the uh, enable pin to power instead of where it should have been. It was going well, it was either power or ground, one of the two. And I kept trying to upload and it would, it would upload and it, but it wouldn't like reset. And if I unplugged it and plugged it back in, it'd reset and then work. And then there was like some other weird stuff. And it turned out I'm looking at it real closely. I'm like, I got a wire in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, it was basically holding the the holding the switch, if you will, the pin in a mode that said, you know, stay in this programming mode and don't reset or with something like that. I, I can't remember exactly it. It was it was a little frustrating until I finally noticed what what I had done wrong, um, but uh, yeah, overall you know it's uh, all of it works great. I've like I said I tested it with the I tested with the servos. I tested the tested the outputs of the tip 102 things. You know they just plug right into these uh, into these uh, terminal stri or terminal blocks I should say. Um, you know if you if you you know I could show you. Notice the uh, notice the little black dot. I got those there. You can see it right there. You can see them on and near the pins of some of the other stuff. That just means that's the negative terminal or ground terminal. Um, making a marking there because uh, you know, like in the case of the servos, I need them properly plugged in so they'll work. And you know, same with uh, same with the uh, other ones. I need things to be plugged in properly. And you know, if I you know. I've considered, you know, I just used a Sharpie to mark this, um, you know, if I had some little, you know, little things of maybe some tester, uh, black paint and red paint, um, you know, I could pop dots on them, you know, if you build something like this, I recommend you do something in order to be able to differentiate what terminal is what, because especially once you have one of these things mounted, you won't be able to look at the bottom of it in order to determine what, what signals are what. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you know, even, even if it's, even if that's a worst case scenario, and I wouldn't really recommend this, but, you know, if even worst case scenario, if you just, uh, you know, if you just make a diagram on a piece of paper that says, okay, this is this and this is that, uh, that's better than nothing. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, yeah, these, uh, little USB converter things make getting five volts, uh, close to one amp it's funny these things are like sold to be like oh this is one amp or two amp one you open it up and the chip on it only supports like 800 millivolts or so or 800 milliamps or something like that you know in other words they lie um this actually outputs uh i think it was like 700 milliamps and then shuts down at 800 milliamps plenty of power in order to give you three 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 point three volts to run the esp32 as well as the rs232 converter chip and the five volt output has more than enough, you know, even to run a servo. I was able to run a servo off this, no problem. Um, probably couldn't run two servos. That might be pushing it. Um, but uh, it's just a it's just a real simple integrated circuit on here that doesn't have very good documentation. Well, it actually has good documentation. Fortunately, you have to be able to read Chinese in order to understand what it's saying. Um, but the basics of it is, you know, it's only got eight pins and they're laid out. It's, you know, the example circuit's easy to follow and everything and it's a virtually identical to what's already on here. You can just pull this one of these things off, desolder some parts, pop it in place with a few, you know, maybe a few pieces of wire in order to hold things together. And you've got yourself a nice, a nice, essentially what's a switching 12 volt to five volt um, buck converter. Um, and you can buy these at a dollar store for it's a buck converter for a buck um very uh very simple very easy to use and you know it it was it was better than you know i could have i could have put a, like a seven you know i considered putting like a 7805 on here 
But then I was like, I've got these things, and that's what I bought them. You know, I not bought them. Somebody gave them to me. That's what I have them for. That's why I kept them. So, you know, hey, let's let's give that a shot and pop it on here. Plus, uh, you know, with the problem, you know, this this is, you know, it's a it's a it's a nice it's a nice it's a nice regulator. It's you know it uh, like I said it it's essentially kind of a switching style regulator, um, and uh, it doesn't get hot even under you know even under a higher load um, not like uh, 7805 which is a linear regulator would actually get so that basically covers that you know I will uh, I will be putting up information onto the onto the uh, github for Jetbotics that'll detail the uh, you know the schematics that I used to uh, work with this you know it, it isn't going to give it will not give you the layout of this uh, of this board um, but I will have pictures of the front and the back of the board if you so dare to try to replicate it. Um, honestly, I would say try not to. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, like I said, I'm not going to win any awards on this. So, but I'm going to have all the information up there. You know where what you know as well as the code I used to test it and everything. And uh, you know that's uh, you know that that may help you uh, with uh, with your own design so uh, you know if, if anything the best you know probably the best part uh, of the whole thing um, is probably these tip 102 uh, switching things and honestly they're not that complicated it's just a transistor switch nothing nothing special or fun fancy there so uh, the only thing I got left to do on this board before I actually transplant it and mount it inside the enclosure is I'm going to add some blops of uh, hot glue on some of these wires to keep them held down so they don't move around or or get shifted around as I'm putting things together and you know maybe maybe a blop or two of hot glue on this ESP32 to hold hold it better in place because right now it's just friction and well not even really the wire wrap because the wire wrap can slide on the pins um, in, cert in certain ways um, just because of the way wire wrap works um, so I think if I add some little bits of hot glue, that'll help keep it in place and whatnot. Um, but, uh, yeah, if I had, if I had to do this over again, um, well, honestly, I would probably try to get some of the, you know, some of those spring headers and, you know, and put it, put it together that way and solder everything, um, on the backside. That'd probably be about really the, the only really the only change I'd, I'd probably make um, or maybe you know maybe if I had some way of uh, laying this out better so for the wiring and such because uh, sometimes I for running the ground and the power lines it was like a question of well where should I go with these um, this was really free free form done I didn't have really a good plan other than other than you know setting the board down down and you know, it's just looking at it and placing the parts on it and saying, well, where can I put this? And would this be better here or over here? You know, and how do I have, uh, you know, how do I have certain things? And unfortunately, that did lead to one minor problem. Well, I shouldn't say problem. It, I was able to work it out. Was the was that auto switch uh, thing for the reset? Because I'd put things together and then I'd realized, oh heck, I had totally forgot to put that in place. I hope I have enough room somewhere to put it nearby because I wanted to put it in such a way that it would be near the pins that it needed on the ESP32 um, without having to run up too much wire around. And you know, I did have enough room between the between that voltage regulator board and the ESP32, so I could slot it right in there just fine, and uh, that that worked out. But uh, yeah, you know, a little bit more planning probably would have been probably would have been better. I do know of one, I know of one, you know, and I might actually link to it. I well, I probably can't link to it because I don't think it exists anymore. But I could probably put a copy up somewhere. I'm not sure. There's a, there used to be a piece of software that somebody was developing that w was written in Java, worked really well, allowed you to lay out these kind of grid proto board strip board things. It's kind of meant for. Uh, Used by uh, people making uh, like guitarists or whatnot, making um, you know foot or pedals, uh, you know effects pedals, whatnot. Um, but it allowed you to bring in a, a fake strip board and place parts on it, and it was actually very useful um, to uh, to do this kind of you know some of, some of this kind of prototyping. 
Um, so I'll see if I can find that, and uh, if I can, I'll uh, I'll put it up on I'll put it up on the GitHub or somewhere so that uh, you guys can uh, you know take a look at it. Uh, but it's not very easy to install. Like I said, it's based around it's it was written in Java, and to be honest, who knows if it even runs anymore. Um, but I did have it working relatively well on on uh, on my uh, on my Ubuntu box a long time ago, um, you know. But uh, yeah, you know the only you know there there's uh, there are some options I guess. So so uh, yeah, from here I'm going to uh, place put this into the enclosure and uh, hook it all up, do a little few more tests with it, and uh, then I'll you know then I'll. Uh, and I'll show you guys how that uh, how that turned out. So we'll get to that. Okay, so I'm back out here in my shop, and it's for a good reason. I was trying to fit the uh, I was trying to fit this uh, PCB for the uh, ESP32 into the enclosure, and unfortunately, it won't fit. And uh, the reason why is, well, basically, the way I was going to fit it in place, I'm going to stand up here so I can kind of show you, is I was going to take the PCB, and it was going to be fitted something like this into, into the enclosure, basically right there. But it needed to be set in deeper. And these screw terminals, there's just not enough room between them, all the parts, the switch body here, and everything else. It just, it, it, it needs a little bit of room on the bottom because there are, the solder points and such are, uh, you know, sticking, sticking out. So I needed to, you know, basically need to be sunk down in there further than, well, it just won't fit. That's, that's all there is to it. So, I've got to make a little adjustment, a tiny little adjustment. Well, okay, it's a major adjustment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually piggyback a second enclosure on the back of the first one. It's not ideal, but it'll work. And the enclosure, oh, and by the way, that was going to be fitted in there. I was going to, you know, this is the back plate of the of that enclosure, and I was it was going to be fitted in there, you know, something like, well, something like this. It was going to sit like that, and it, it just, there's just not enough room with, with standoffs to raise it up and fit it and everything. Well, even if it was laying flat, there still wouldn't be enough room. The second enclosure I have, though, is this one. And it actually is of the right size. It'll, it'll fit everything. Just, uh... I don't know, it's about maybe uh, an inch and a quarter deep. I'm not exactly certain exactly how big it is. Um, you can find out how big it is, I suppose. It's, it's, a, it's a Hammond enclosure. I think I picked it up at a ham fest. 1591-G um, is, I believe, the product number. That's at least what it says inside there. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can even see that. Oh, well, there, there's a nice reflection. You can probably see it right there. All right, so. I was just going to mount it inside the enclosure like this, piggyback this one onto the main enclosure. So it would be something like this on there, if you can kind of see that. And then drill some holes, mount it on there with some nuts and bolts and a hole to allow the pass through of the wiring and everything. And it should be good. It's uh, again not ideal, but I think it'll I think it'll work out. That's the hope. That's always been the hope. <laughs> so you know we're going to give it a shot. And I'm going to get onto that, get that uh, fabricated, and then I'll show you what it looks like. So give me a chance. One moment. All right. So here's the piggyback arrangement. You can see I got a hole that goes through to the other side over here. Yeah. Right here. Right there. That goes through to the other side of the enclosure. This uh, 
the board itself mounts onto a cup four uh, posts standoff posts down the side here there'll be some uh, nuts that'll hold it on but just like that over on this side is a hole to access the uh, the USB port and uh, yeah that's pretty much it I've got a one of the, ser the one of the servo cables hanging out you can just fit through the fit through that hole and come out the back side and well ultimately it comes out to this hole but uh, yeah you know that's that's basically it right there so what I'm gonna do is uh, get this uh, get this board fully mounted uh, get the cables all hooked up and then uh, do a little bit more testing on it put the robot back together and then I'll show you what everything looks like so that was my solution to this problem man oh what a day what a day all right so uh, here it is all hooked up uh, got everything in the uh, in the piggyback case or enclosure closures here everything's wired up so uh, let me uh, let me show you how it works so uh, right now I'm just simulating a battery I don't this battery isn't uh, well it's a dead battery and you can't charge it I need to get a new I need to get a new battery that's coming but for now I have this uh, this uh, power supply here it's a 10 amp power supply uh, works very well so I have it hooked up and uh, that's uh, that's basically you know um, how, how I'm how I've been simulating how I've been uh, you know testing this to a certain extent so uh, I'm gonna turn it on and uh, then we're going to uh, turn the actual system on so we'll uh, hit the breaker here and uh, I don't know if you can probably can't see these but the uh, the uh, LED lights for the fuses are all Four are all on. We'll turn on the uh, we'll turn on the power to the ESP32, and you can see that it's running a program right now. And what this program is is a program that will flash the beacon, do the uh, do the audio audio alert beacon, and also work the motors. So first I'm gonna first I'm going to uh, turn on the power for the uh, for the beacons um, and uh, that'll be this switch here and uh, as you can see well still nothing's really happening oh well there there's uh, there's one of the flashes and uh, really not much else is happening um, what's actually happening right now is it's uh, sending uh, servo signals and there's the beep for the uh, for the uh, audible alert so it's just cycling through, but it's sending servo signals like right now um, for the each of the motors. But the motors aren't turned on. They're not turned on. You can see how that's a, a handy thing right now. I I don't have to worry about this thing driving off if I you know if I've sat it down. But you know probably want to see how the motors work. So we'll turn on one, and uh, you can see this comes on. This one's not on yet. We'll turn it on. And you can see that this one's working here right now. Now, uh, this is moving forward and uh, flashes the light. Then uh, that one is moving backwards, slows down, stops, should go forward, goes forward, slows down, stops, beeps. This one goes backwards and then it should go forwards. and then it should flash and that's the cycle that it does now one thing you might notice here notice how this one's kind of slowly moving backwards well it's not calibrated properly these uh, these motor controllers um, this one's not its center point isn't quite calibrated properly I have the center point in the code set to 1500 this particular one it's about 1480 and that just slight difference means it decides it's moving backwards um, whenever it, it gets higher in uh, in uh, PETA or you know basically a wider PWM or whatnot 
that means go backwards. Smaller PWM uh, means go forwards. That's just how it's wired up right now. I mean, I could swap these uh, leads and whatnot to reverse that, but, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know. It's all programmatic anyhow. Um, so, you know, that's basically it. Now, the one thing I want to point out, and I'm going to just turn this off so that it's not distracting or anything. Turn these off. Turn that off. And get rid of that. And turn that off. All right. So, what I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to put the cover on eventually. That'll go over the top of this and button it all up. Got to get a battery, an actual battery. Um, charge it up and everything. Um... And then, you know, we're going to move into programming. But uh, one thing I wanted to mention, during the course of implementing all these electronics, implementing this and everything, one thing that I found was constantly test your circuits. And whenever you're testing them, don't test them with your largest power supply you have or a battery or anything like that. And if you do, make sure you have a fuse because if something goes wrong, you can, you know, you can let the smoke out. That's putting it mildly. You could actually catch a fire. What I've been using, what I used quite often was just a 9-volt battery. It is more than enough to power these lights, even though it's, even though it's a 12-volt battery. Even though this is a 12-volt buzzer, 9-volt worked fine. Um, could even power the fans on these can't actually power these motors no way <laughs> no way they pull way too much current but uh for the most part it allowed me to do the right test you know do testing without worrying about uh overloading or um you know if something shorted out i didn't really have to worry about that um in other tests i used a, a small uh, 12 volt um you know 12 volt power supply something one of them was 300 milliamps output and the other was uh, a one amp output and uh, those uh, those worked well those worked well as well uh, one thing I do want to mention here that uh, I found out today was that uh, this particular uh, 5 volt uh, 12 volt 5 volt uh, power supply does not have enough current handling in order to actually um, put a signal to a real servo uh, a regular sized uh, servo I had this uh, I don't have it sitting here right now. It's out in my shop. I had this uh, Futaba servo, uh, standard, pretty much a standard size servo, not one of the little mini ones. Uh, mini ones might actually work just fine. I didn't try one of those. Um, but a standard size servo, um, what it would do is it would try to power it up. Uh, and this only happened, if I had it plugged into USB with uh, power, it was fine. If I just had power going to the circuit, even if it was from uh, even if it was from this this thing, uh, the five volt power for the servos was actually coming from the uh, from from the voltage regulator this little voltage regulator board here, and what it would do is it would uh, sag the voltage and trip the uh, ESP32 brownout detector and it would reboot and sag the voltage and just keep doing that over and over and eventually it would just crash. Um, but if I plugged in both both one of those power supplies as well as USB um, because uh, if I plug in USB here it's kind of interesting because the, the way things are hooked up it supplies some of that 5 volt from the USB to the actual circuit you don't actually want to try to run anything like a servo or something off the USB but it gave it that extra little current in order to work um, and that's just uh, that's just a limitation of you know what the ESP32 is drawing plus everything else plus the low output of that voltage regulator. Um, however, it's not a problem, as you know, obviously, as you can see, I don't have anything connected up to the ESP32. There's a little hole here for the USB um, that it worked fine with these controllers, and that's because these motor controllers, they're not actually, all they're doing is taking the PWM signal and they run off of the voltage di virtually directly from, from the power supply or battery or whatnot um, so I imagine the way it's implemented now I don't know this for sure because I've never been able to see or find a schematic for the uh, Victor 884s um, but uh, I believe that what's actually happening is that the is that the 
you know, number one, there's no, there's no voltage going into these, and it's using voltage just from its own input, and that the PWM signal is probably going into an opto isolator or something of that nature, uh, which requires very little current. So it, it, it's able to power this kind of stuff just fine, um, but uh, yeah, that, uh, that particular regulator is just a little bit too small to actually drive real servos, um, which <laughs> really isn't an issue here. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not intending to ever drive a real servo. This, this, this robot is just basically a platform that moves around. Um, I can't show right now. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to try to figure out a way to, you know, maybe set something up, maybe do a screen, a screen, ca or a screen capture or something um, of the capturing of the data from the uh, U.S. from the uh, GPS, uh, the GPS receiver up here, um, just to kind of show you right up here. Um, this this is uh, this is a Garmin E-Trex, and uh, I've been able to capture data from it uh, from the I've got this custom cable going in and it's it it leads into the uh, max 232 converter right here which uh, sends its uh, input and output to TTL levels to the ESP32 I mean I was able to capture data and everything so that's not going to be an issue um, you know for for the actual for the actual robot um, it's just um, not it's just not something that's very easy to uh, you know to really show in this kind of a format um, and I don't know I'm probably gonna have to set up a laptop or something to you know show show how things look I'm not sure we'll we'll see where that goes probably with uh, whenever 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 I get around to doing the software uh, development and everything so uh, yeah that's basically where it's at so our next thing is going to be uh, looking into building building software so you know, getting this thing actually uh, programmed and running. So, uh, yeah.